Hi, it's good to be with everyone. And um, what a nice thing to have some folks who saw the link I put up in my newsletter uh, come in tonight. And I just, I had a great time last week uh, with you all. And I wanted to share that. Um, and I know that a lot of people watch the, watch the video. So uh, here we are. Oh my gosh, the second week. I, I had kind of quite a day. Um, our dog is sick. And so he had to go and get an ultrasound and we think it's a benign tumor. So if anybody wants to pray for Diana's dog, it's looking optimistic, but, um, I, I, it's so hard when you're, when your pet is not happy. What's your dog's name? We all, we all believe in praying for animals. Well, okay. Everybody here is going to laugh. His name is Rowan. <laughs> yeah he was named after the archbishop of canterbury rowan williams knows that i named my dog after him he's okay with it <laughs> so um tonight i actually have been looking forward to sharing these two chapters uh with you all in particular i think these these two chapters speak not only to our experience as individuals <laughs> but also this is sort of the heart of Southern culture. Uh, chapters three and four in Freeing Jesus take place in my uh, adolescence and early uh, young adulthood. So the, the two chapters run from about age 14 up until um, age 22 or thereabouts. So it covers high school and college. The images here and the central, the central two chapters are familiar ones. Uh, Jesus as Savior and Jesus as Lord. As a matter of fact, I say in the book itself that if you were to go down the street and ask people who Jesus was, nine, time, nine times out of ten, I bet, especially in, in Atlanta, uh, you get the line that, hey, Jesus is the Savior. And so that's a such a common, common image. And the same goes for Lord. Uh, we think about that word a lot. And as a matter of fact, the confessions that we have in the gospel narratives, when we get to the point where Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Uh, most of the people who are, who, kind, who get it right, um, say something about Jesus uh, being Lord. And so, Two familiar images, um, images of culture and images of creed. I want to do something I think a little different tonight, and that is while these these two chapters are kind of, are a very cohesive piece in terms of the time in my own life, I thought we might want to separate them a little bit. And so I'm going to talk first about Jesus as Savior, and then um, I guess Ed's going to respond a little bit, and we'll open it up to those questions, and then I'll move into a kind of a second uh, mini discussion period where I'll, I, I'll talk for probably about 15 minutes about Jesus is Lord. And then we'll do the same thing just because I thought there was so much here uh, that people would have trouble um, keeping track of all their questions through both halves. So let me just begin then with a, the savior chapter. Uh, there are a, a whole number of things that surprised me about writing this chapter. You know, first of all, I share a story that I didn't realize was so uh, much a shared uh, response to a very familiar prayer. And that is, I tell the story about how when I was a little girl, my mother used to sit at my bedside and pray every night with me. Uh, the now I lay me down to sleep prayer with about Jesus. And I tell how that terrified me. <laughs> and how It scared me to think uh, that it was something that I would die you know, in the middle of the night and, and that my mom thought that that was okay uh, to pray with me before I went to sleep. And so I, I did grow up, um, even though not a lot of people who I knew had died when I was a little kid, my grandfather did die when I was 10. But other than that, uh, I, my grandparents were all, all the rest of them were still alive. There were there was no one who was a friend who passed away or anything like that when I was a little kid, but I was really scared of dying. And um, it was 
I, I really don't know where it came from. Something about that prayer or something about um, just sort of the way that I that I was made. And so those those questions about death really uh, troubled me from from a very young age. So so that's the way the chapter opens. And um, I think that lots of us uh, might experience uh, Jesus as Savior, first of all, through uh, some sort of longing to understand about death or heaven and hell, uh, whatever comes next. And yet, even with that sense of longing and with my own questions, probably the most shocking thing that I found while I was doing the research for this chapter. And I don't think I ever realized this, and I'm not sure if you realize it or not, but Jesus is only called Savior twice in the Gospels. And I literally had to go back when I read that in, in some commentary, I had to go back and check it for myself because I was not sure that I believed it. Since the title is so familiar, I was positive that it had to have been something that Jesus was referred to more often. But instead, as I mentioned last week, the most used title for Jesus in the New Testament by his, in the Gospels by his friends is the title title teacher. And it's interesting because our culture has, you know, flipped those two things around. You more often hear Jesus called Savior and it's become a much rarer thing, I think, to hear Jesus talk, talked about as, um, as teacher. So I wanted to share uh, a, a story from this chapter to sort of take you to a, a place. Um, Scottsdale Bible Church in Scottsdale, Arizona, in the middle part of the 1970s, the time in which the nice Methodist girl of chapters one and two uh, ran into her first ever, I literally had never run into anybody who was an evangelical or a fundamentalist um, up until then. There were Pentecostals in my universe when I was a little kid because my grandmother who passed away uh, when I was what, bef well before I was born um, and I had a step-grandmother growing up, but my, my, my biological grandmother, uh, she had died when she was 26 and she had been ordained to the ministry as a as a preaching a lay evangelist uh, by Amy Semple McPherson in a Pentecostal revival um, in the early uh, 1920s and so she was kind of an amazing person and her brother uh, my great uncle uh, became a Pentecostal minister. He was also ordained by Amy Semple McPherson, and he founded the first ever Foursquare Gospel Church in uh, Ellicott City, Maryland. And so we had this sort of stream in our family, but everybody else was Methodist or Lutheran. And um, all the Methodists and Lutherans kind of looked over at the Pentecostals and said, hmm. And my mother used to refer to them as our holy roller relatives. And so that kind of gives you a sense of how my parents viewed um, that kind of enthusiastic uh, forms of Christianity. So we just didn't know anybody except for these few relatives um, who were parts of these churches. Yet when we moved uh, from Maryland to Scottsdale, Arizona, when I was 13 years old, everything shifted. And one of the things that changed is that my parents had my brother and I confirmed in the Methodist church and then they quit church. And so I am always very skeptical of people talking about how just now folks are quitting church because my parents quit church in 1974, 1975, they just stopped going. And that meant that we as teenagers, the three, the, us three kids, we were sort of lost and we had to fend for ourselves spiritually. So let me just uh, read you a little bit about uh, an encounter that I had with my friend, Phil. I don't identify him here, but later on, Phil went off to Cambridge University, has a PhD, and uh, he founded one of the largest mega churches um, in South Central Pennsylvania, a church of around 10,000 people uh, now. And uh, 
we've we've actually stayed friends um, all these years and had some vigorous and exciting arguments along the way. So, uh, Phil, have you been born again? My friend Phil asked me several weeks later. That was after I sort of came to this personal realization that Jesus was indeed my savior. And so Phil continued, confessed your sins, given your life to Jesus. Is Jesus your savior? Y yes, I replied somewhat shape sheepishly. Where, when, he wanted to know. I knew he would want a place and time. You had to have a testimony to fit in. I hesitated telling him that I had not confessed my sins, for I was not convinced that I was a sinner in the ways that my new friends seemed to expect. There were heartbreaking stories about drugs and sex, about hating parents and pride, about cheating on tests and shoplifting, about lying to teachers and beating up sissies in the locker room. I had no idea that high school was such a soap opera, and I had studiously avoided all of those sins. Sure, I had broken some rules, including getting in some bad arguments with my brother and, rather shamefully, having stolen quarters from my mother's dressing table. Maybe I was overly proud of my good grades and a bit judgmental about my friends' parties and drinking, but these things did not seem to qualify as the sort of big sins uh, that Scottsdale Bible seemed to expect. Maybe I was not bad enough to get saved. I was a good girl, obedient generally kind, helpful, aghast when people were not nice. That was like, I thought the biggest sin in the world, people not being nice. I took after my mother that way and always wanting to do the right things. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, yes, I replied again, thinking about his question. I did not have a litany of sins to confess, but I did trust that Jesus was my savior. Sin was not my problem as much as feeling lost dislocated, separated from everyone and everything I knew and loved, cut off from my roots, unsure what to believe, even if the ground under my feet was hard and unyielding. I did not tell Phil how my uncle, after he arrived from Baltimore to visit, used to invade my bedroom at night. No, I did not sin. I was sinned against. At 15, however, I was smart enough to figure out that Phil would say that my lack of forgiveness was a sin. Years later, I would come across these words from Jesus scholar Marcus Borg. Quote, some people do not feel much guilt. Guilt is not the central issue of their lives. Yet they may have strong feelings of bondage or strong feelings of alienation or estrangement. For such people, the conventional rendering of Jesus as Savior, the one who takes away whatever is sinful and unclean in their lives, makes no sense. Borg insists, however, there are other things from which one needed to be saved. Victimization, meaninglessness, suffering. Jesus offers the, quote, good news of coming home from exile in the wilderness. And he continues, for some, the need is liberation. For others, the need is homecoming. And for others, for still others, the need is acceptance. No matter our experience or our deepest needs, Jesus saves. Homecoming. Yes, I needed a home, a safe and familiar home. And that becomes sort of the, the key part of this chapter. Um, while I use that conventional term, Jesus as Savior, what I hope to do with my readers is to lead them into some level of complexity about the nature of sin and what we need to be saved from. And so that whole idea that Borg presents, that was a really important thing for me when I heard him say that. And later, you know, he, he did write that in a couple of different books, actually. And it affirmed something that I had been su suspecting, you know, my whole life, that I did need to be saved, but I didn't quite need to be saved from the things that um, Scottsdale Bible wanted me to be saved of. And so this chapter begins to go into 
what becomes a thread uh, throughout the rest of the book. And that is around ideas um, regarding original sin and the nature of human beings. You know, what, what is it that happened in Genesis? How sinful are we? And um, what is God, <coughs> excuse me, and what does um, salvation say um, about those things? And what is salvus? What is healing? So the, the conventional title becomes deepened. Excuse me. <coughs> it's also allergy season here. Oh. So the conventional uh, title becomes deepened. And in, the, in that deepening, I hope to um, allow people who might have had a similar kind of experience in a Baptist church, in a Bible church, in a, in a fundamentalist uh, congregation, or even in Pentecostalism, to be able to not stay, to not stay away from that word, to be able to re-embrace it and claim it again as a really important part of this, the the witness of the New Testament to who Jesus is, because even though it's not in the gospel, it certainly does show up in Paul and in the rest of the New Testament as one of the themes um, about Jesus' identity. So, so I, I love that idea of reclaiming things, but reclaiming them differently. And I also love the idea that people who might have been reading that for the first time and who don't have those experiences uh, might be able to look in a window um, into the life of someone they, they uh, respect as an author and see that I am not ashamed of those years that I spent in the Bible church. Um, and I, I think I was for a while, but one of the joys of writing this book was to be able to go back and look at my own experience and to integrate it into who I am now. And I was surprised at how much fun I had writing that chapter. And you might kind of sense that when I start, you know, I describe sitting around campfires in the backyard or conversations that I had with different people. And um, it gave me an opportunity to appreciate uh, the 15 year old girl who really did need saving. Um, and even if she didn't need saving quite in the way that her friends wanted her to be saved, uh, to go back and to ex re explore that world almost like a sort of a, a time traveler and um, even deal with, you know, the end times and Larry Norman songs and all kinds of crazy things from the 1970s. So I want to open up here to Ed. Uh, as I know, we share some of that uh, experience of those kinds of, of theological angles into who Jesus is. And um, I just, uh, I'm anxious to hear his comments. And I'm really anxious to hear all your comments uh, about this chapter. So everybody, um, I'm going to pose a couple of questions to Diana about the salvation chapter, <coughs> I mean, the savior chapter. And um, let me go ahead and invite your, if you have questions to pose to Diana, to go ahead and file them in the chat. Um, but Diana, I've got two um, questions. Actually, I would love for you to read from page six, 76, the oh. bottom of page 76. I just found that paragraph that goes to the bottom of page 76 to the top of page 77 to be salvific. Um, oh. <laughs> I cut off too soon for you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that, that this would be a holy reading. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll go one paragraph further from where I went before. There you go. Yeah. So I, I sort of dropped off at the safe and familiar home and this is yeah. what comes next. Yeah. Right. Um, we often think of being saved as being rescued. And when it comes to Jesus as savior, the popular conception is one of Jesus snatching believers from the perils of hell. Jesus saves us by taking us to heaven. That is not, however, what the word salvation means. The word salvation comes from the Latin salvus, which originally referred to being made whole, uninjured, safe, or in good health. Salvus was not about being taken out of this life, 
It was about this life being healed. In this sense, salvus perfectly describes the biblical vision of God's justice and mercy, peace and well-being, comfort and equanimity. This is the dream of a saved earth, one where oppression ends, mercy reigns, violence ceases to exist, and all live, I love this vision, all live safely under their own vine and fig tree. Jesus, the Savior, is the one who brings this dream to reality. He is peacemaker, light of justice, and the good physician. Jesus saves in all these ways and more. So I have to just state that I'm choked up right now because that is such a powerful description of the universe in which I want to live, the universe that the Episcopal Church has invited me to live. It is the universe where I visit experientially as an actual event every morning during my prayer period in that chair right there um, for 40 years now. Um, it's that here and now whole making, Jesus as whole makers or savior that I just cherish. And I just wanted to applaud that paragraph and the way you took us in this chapter from one universe to another they are two very different universes mm. to live in a set in a in a, a mentality that we are totally depraved yeah to a mentality that our goodness has not been killed sometimes obscured as you say but it ain't wiped out i mean those are just two very different worlds and so thank you is my first comment. And then I want to, to uh, so many people on the screen and we've got more than 93 devices, which means about 120 people to, uh, tonight so far. Uh, many of us have been together with Ebenezer Baptist reading the book Cast during Lent. And as you know, Isabel Wilkerson talks about there being pillars of Cast. And one of them is this whole business of divine design of hierarchy of worth. And I, if, if you don't mind addressing or connecting any dots between this total depravity, you're going to hell if you don't accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior mentality and slaveholder Christianity and all the individual hyper individualism that's in the universe of it all being about being saved from hell. I know that's a big question. Yeah, but it's a good question because that was the harder aspect uh, in some ways of this whole experience when I was 15, 16, 17 years old. Um, there is in these two chapters the, the warm memory of me reclaiming the 15 year old Diana. There is also the voice of all these different people in Scottsdale Bible's universe and then the universe of the, the evangelical college I went to. And um, those, those voices are both, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me to think back at this time because there were things in those voices that were very liberative. They, were, they, they, they really truly did liberate me. They really truly did help save me. Uh, but then there was all this other stuff that came a, a, a around with it. And that was the stuff that was really difficult to, to deal with. I did not tell this story in this book, but I think I told it in another book. And I've certainly used it as an illustration in sermons and other places um, over the years. And that is one of the things that happened at this church, Scottsdale Bible, is that there was part of the attraction for me to this to this church was that there was a group of us as teenagers that met and we ran our own bible study and um it phil he was just you know he was in the year ahead of me at saguaro high school in scottsdale arizona and he was just a tremendous uh sort of uh bible teacher 
at, at 16 years old. And so we would go to this Bible study. It was about 40 people. It was kind of like a young life group. People I know would be familiar with that who are part of this world. And, um, and he would teach, but not every week. It was interesting. Phil would vary it and different people would teach. And sometimes even, even the other girls would teach. And so it was a very free flowing, um, non-hierarchical kind of environment that the teenagers constructed uh, for themselves. And I think it was one of the most radical experiences that I had of the priesthood of all believers, or it was certainly the most radical small group experience that I had had up to that point. And um, so that was, that was life-giving. And a lot of the, the good comments from this chapter come from that, that Bible study. When I was a junior, the church just, I think they decided that we were a little bit out of control and they got us a, a youth group leader and uh, his name was Tim Kimmel. I think he's still alive. Um, he's, he wound up writing a whole bunch of uh, popular books about the family um, in evangelicalism. And um, he was what you describe. And so I'll never forget going to Bible study, this place that, that I loved and found so much freedom. And once Tim had come, we'd still all have Bible study together and he taught it. So he wanted total control of it. He didn't allow anybody else to teach. And then after the Bible study, he divided the room up into boys and girls. And, um, Hey, I came from Methodism. I, I didn't know what they were doing. I, I literally had no clue, but that the boys were supposed to go in this one corner and the girls went into another corner and the boys in their corner got to talk about theology and the girls got to talk about things like, you know, um, Christian dress for success books, you know, it was, it was ridiculous. And so I hated the girls corner. And, you know, my parents didn't go to this church. My parents were liberal Methodists who left church. And I never knew that there were, there were places where girls weren't supposed to go. Um, and so I just went over and hung out with the boys because I liked talking about theology. And uh, for whatever reason, Tim didn't kick, kick, kick me out. Um, he let me stay and I would be the only girl sitting in the boys corner talking about predestination, original sin, all these things it was like going to seminary with a guy who was a professor from Dallas Theological Seminary. And so one day after the Bible study, he came up to me and he was talking to me and he said, you know, you're really good at theology. And I kind of looked at him. I never thought, you know, I didn't even, I'm not, I'm not even sure I knew what the word theology meant, you know, at that point in time. I, so I, I was good at it, whatever it was. And he said, yeah, he, he said, it's, um, it's too bad that you're a girl because if you were a boy, you could go to seminary. And I mean, Ed, you have a pretty good sense of this. I was just rebellious enough. I mean, this is maybe what I, they wanted me to repent of. It's Scottsdale Bible is that I thought to myself, well, hell, I'm going to go. <laughs> I didn't know what a seminary was, but um, I thought, well, if I'm not supposed to, I think that's where I should probably wind up. And so, um, so I did, but that was the first real intrusion of that world of these, of this order upon my universe. And so it happens there too. And so the, the contention, you can kind of see the tension and the contention just start to sort of build in my own soul with the questions that I begin to have. And so that, that becomes, I think, uh, when you run that next to cast, you know, it, it really truly is, you know, part of this universe um, that there is a divine order. And that order is based on hierarchies of, of race, gender, and class, frankly. And sexual orientation? Um, well, you know, back in those days. Oh, I see. I, I mean, nobody even, I mean, certainly it would. Um, right. Because, you know, when people referred to, I mean, I'm thinking about how people referred to gay folks 
back in those days in that setting and please anyone you know who is on this call who happens to be the lgbt community nothing you haven't heard um what those people would have said at that time is they would have linked um lgbtq orientation identity desire to um animal appetites yeah yeah. And so that would, of course, mean that um, gay people were less than human. Right. And so that would put them, they didn't have to have their own slot. They, they just got put all the way down at the bottom of the pyramid. And so, so that is, was part of this world. But it was interesting that there was also part of this world that was not that. And that we as teenagers sort of stumbled into the not that part. Um, kind of all by ourselves. And then the grownups realized that we had to sort of be brought a bit more under control by putting in a, a new youth group leader. And then there were uh, some of my, my young, or some of my friends, my female friends, there was uh, like my best friend, Teresa, who also went to this church. And she was more like me. She, she came from on her own. Her parents went to some other church in Scottsdale, I think a UCC church. And they were kind of horrified, like my parents were, that we were going to this Bible church. Um, but Teresa winds up being um, ordained. Um, she, she's a ordained Mennonite pastor. She's a great human being, went to Fuller Seminary, all these kinds of things. And, you know, no bone of hierarchy in, in Teresa's body. But then on the other hand, some of my other girlfriends were sent by their parents who were members of this church to Bill Gothard seminars. And for those of you, I, I see a couple faces who are just like going, <gasps> because Bill Gothard seminars were like getting sent to military school for gender. And so they were these, these like week, week long boot camps that had these, these workbooks that came out of them. And then you'd go back like the next year for another week. And then you go back another year for or the next year for another week. And it was all about learning your place in the hierarchy and bill gothard seminars were i mean i have friends that i don't know that they'll ever recover yeah. from having been sent to those things and and so so that was what this world was like um and you asked the bigger question about history and what i what i know in my capacity as a person with a phd in american religious history is that that was nothing new for evangelicalism to have that contention around Jesus as savior, because when evangelicalism was first introduced in the American South, the people, and, and this is in the 1700s, the people that it appealed the most to were women and enslaved people. And the, the liberation aspect of evangelicalism, especially over and against the orderliness of Anglicanism, the, the liberation aspect of particularly the Methodist message, um, just it set the South on fire. And when it, when it did that, all of the sudden you had basically um, enslaved people who were uh, preaching, who were demanding baptism, you had women who were out of their place, who, who were praying in public, who were being disruptive of Anglican churches, all of this sort of stuff. And so the earliest impulse of evangelicalism in the South was to overturn um, the hierarchies. And it took about, so at first the, the people who hated it most were Anglican patriarchs, which were mostly white men who happened to be plantation holders, very wealthy men, business owners, things like that. Um, but other people got scared too. And eventually uh, within a, about 30 or 40 years of the first introduction of evangelicalism to the South to around 1801, uh, even evangelicals themselves begin to mute the message because they get scared of the rabble rousing potential, especially re related to slavery. And so they started clamping down and they started to echo 
the sort of older hierarchical view of the world more than the powerful uh, sort of priesthood of all people, uh, a new age has come uh, kind of vision of the first generation of evangelicalism. And so I think of it as a tremendously sad story. And in some senses that the academic story of evangelicalism echoed in my own experience. So I run into it, I run into evangelicalism, I had no experience of it. And when I ran into it, it was like, Jesus set me free. And I literally say that in the book, Jesus, you know, Jesus uh, became my savior um, with a little help from Yale locks to keep my uncle out of the, <laughs> out of my bedroom. And so, uh, so yeah, it was powerful. And yet <coughs> the new, youth, the new youth pastor, you yeah. know, and that, <clears throat> that's the, the, the compulsion, I think, of evangelicalism. It's like, yeah, set people free, but we got to put them back in jail. And so freeing Jesus, of course, becomes, yeah. you know, yeah. one of the places the title comes from, frankly. Well, because of our time, we're going to have to segue okay. over to Lord. But um, I do simply, Diane, I want to say three really quick things. Yes. Number one, Judith Smith uh, talked about one of our favorite collects in the prayer book, God whose property is always to have mercy which is a wonderful counterweight to the total depravity, sin, hell orientation. There's nobody outside the blanket of God's property, which is always to have mercy. The second thing I wanted to say is the section in the Savior chapter about the Celtic Christianity teacher is <laughs> amazing and that she came into the class and the first thing she did was light that candle and yep. pray that Celtic prayer. I'm just file by title. Everybody, please go to that chapter and read that. Stunning. And then also, Diana has a People's History of the Church book, um, uh, The Howard Zenification of Christianity, where she tells the real story. And she's alluded to that just now. In, so you can get your Christianity set straight by reading. <laughs> What's the official title of that book? Of it's yours? actually called A People's History of Christianity. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it was it, the original title was, um, I, I wish we would have called it this. Uh, oh, gosh. Uh, Jesus, Jesus after after Christianity or something like that. It was, it was a really clever title. And uh, I, I really liked it. It was about the other side of the story. And yeah. so, yeah, we, so we set, kept the other side of the story as a, as a subtitle, but yeah, people's history, and Christianity. And, and yes, that was an amazing, she was an amazing person, an Episcopal priest and a oh, PhD yeah. in medieval history, a noted feminist scholar. And when she did that thing with the, the, liturgy the celtic liturgy in that class she blew my mind i was actually sort of terrified of her and um yet it was so she drew me in so deeply and years later um she found one of my books and she she read it and i had mentioned something about her in in some other this other book and she sent me a letter and we oh, re oh. we reconnected and I'm not sure if she's, she's still alive. She's very old now. Um, and she had been a priest in Vermont for many years, way up at the Canadian border. And she sent me as a gift, one of her, her childhood prayer book. Wow. And so I have that right here in my office. And it was a token of connection. And I got to thank her. Yeah. That's yeah, it, was, it was an amazing moment. And I, I love when life takes us in those places. Mary Kay posted in the chat that uh, it was deep in evangelicalism that she met Jesus. And the fact of the matter is, there is a sweet Jesus, a very sweet, mm -hmm. what I call a Methodist oriented Jesus, not a Baptist oriented Jesus, in evangelicalism, who really does love us. And so, but let's go to Lord, please. <laughs> well, the both of these uh, chapters introduce some level of tension that again, here with the Lord title, I see something that is incredibly positive. And I tell this, <laughs> by this is probably my favorite set of memories from college when I, so I, I go from the Bible church and I 
go to an evangelical college in California, Santa Barbara, California, uh, that Ed knows. And uh, <laughs> so I'm always a little reluctant to mention them by name, but you can look them up. And I do thank them in the acknowledgments. Um, but um, my favorite set of memories has to do again with a group that was run primarily by students and it happened in my sophomore year and if any of you went to an evangelical college this is an incredibly common story is there was a revival there are always revivals at evangelical colleges and um and the one that was most uh sort of famous in the four years i was there was this one there were these two guys jimmy and john and they read the verse about how christ jesus calls us to to pick up our crosses follow him and to die to ourselves and they were just like struck by lightning as if they were both john wesley and they uh wanted to figure out what it meant to die to self and they started this bible study in a in a lounge um that was the dorm where i happened to live and before we knew it there were 70 80 90 people uh, on an evening at this bible study and the whole focus was what does it mean that Jesus is Lord and not just Savior? And so we began this journey of exploring that together. And the tension that emerges in the chapter is the most sort of accessible idea of Jesus as Lord in this evangelical college was one that I have held on to my entire life. And it was the idea that jesus was found on the streets with the poor and that jesus was lord in the sense that there was a political message to the gospel about fixing what was broken in the world and so so the the the, the good scenes the beautiful scenes in this chapter um run from the the bible study that we organized ourselves to a street ministry toward a village made out of tires in Ensenada, Mexico, where my friends and I went on mission work. We were building actually an orphanage there. And um, we did that all ourselves. Nobody told us to do it. We simply started this project. It became called Potter's Clay. And uh, by the time I graduated from college there, we had organized three to 400 students a year to go down into Mexico and plant gardens, help uh, people with issues related to ecology and environmental cleanup, uh, did, we're building this orphanage and we were preaching in churches and leading groups of little kids uh, in Sunday school kinds of classes and doing vacation Bible school with little Mexican kids. And so, so that amazing um, image, and it was out of all that, that I dreamt of becoming a missionary. And so the, the first time I ever went overseas was in the capacity of a summer mission program run by something called international crusades which was even problematic in 1980 as a name and um there i had visions of you know converting thousands of of dutch people to jesus and i didn't wind up doing that at all instead i wound up in the kitchen of a really old man uh cleaning up the worst filthiest kitchen environment I have ever seen in my entire life. Um, and it was part, we did it under the auspices of the Dutch uh, government has a social service network that people can volunteer for that goes into the homes of the elderly and the disabled and does tasks for them that they can't do. And so the mission or missionaries were smart enough to figure out that nobody really in Holland wanted to hear their gospel. And so instead they sent us out into this volunteer program. And um, I, had this remarkable experience with this older man in this kitchen and he didn't speak english and i didn't speak very much dutch and yet the holy spirit showed up and those stories constitute what i now know to be a vision of the kingdom of god and that the lordship of jesus is located within kinship how we are all related to one another, our connection to one another. And I explore in that whole section, the kinship 
of us with God and the relationship between the word kin and kind and the image of our kind Lord that emerges out of Julian of Norwich. And so all of that was present in my evangelical college. That's where I first learned it. Oscar Romero shows up there, Bonhoeffer, Martin Luther King Jr., all of my heroes all show up in this chapter. Um, but then something else happened. And that something else began to happen my, um, I guess it was the fall of my senior year. And um, that was 1980. I graduated uh, from college in 1981. And we were taking a class and it was called the History of American Evangelicalism. And someone brought in a copy of Time Magazine to the class. And the cover story was on the reemergence or the emergence of uh, the moral majority. Uh, the moral majority had only been around for literally a few months. And um, I'm not sure if Jerry Falwell was actually on the cover, but it was certainly a prominent story in the magazine. And the, my classmate held, them, held it up and we all looked at it. Here we are in Southern California. And I refer to the kind of evangelicalism that was very prominent in Southern California in the 1970s as the sort of radical ed West Coast edge of the, of the hippie Jesus movement. And I, and I, I call it the, the last faint golden glow of 1970s evangelicalism in California. And so we're all that sitting in this classroom. And we look at this picture of Jerry Falwell and Thomas Road Baptist Church and people there waving flags and wearing red, white, and blue outfits. And literally it was as if somebody had sent us back in a time machine. We were all, we're, we're 18, 19, 20 years old and we are all laughing at this photograph, like who could ever believe that? And where the hell is Lynchburg, Virginia? And 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 what? Who who is this clown? And so we were making fun of it, and the professor, who was a little wiser than we were, because we were all Southern California, Arizona, Portland, Oregon people, you know. And um, the professor said, "Oh no, you have to understand. Uh, if you ask somebody, they're an evangelical, pretty much anywhere." Uh, east of New Mexico. <laughs> um, this is the kind of evangelicalism is that's part of it. And, um, and, and you need to understand that that's, it's pretty common in a place like Southern Virginia. And we looked at it and we thought, no way. And yet within just a couple months, you know, and, and the way that chapter ends, I talk about how Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell are at the inauguration of Ronald Reagan and Oscar Romero has been shot. And what it does is it sets up what becomes a tension that we all live with still today is that evangelicalism had the capacity of understanding the gold glow of radical evangelicalism that would look for, with friendly eyes towards Oscar Romero, but this different idea of lordship, the hierarchy, the orderliness, the patriarch re reintroduction of patriarchy, um, all of those things, that was what won that election. And that idea of Lord, Jesus as the domineering Lord, the ruler to whom everyone will submit. That's the other idea of Lord. And it, 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 just came to such a head in the 1970s and I was just a you know college student just naive college student watching all that happen and yet that argument would wind up having a huge and profound impact on my own life and so savior and lord contention around savior and then an outright war within evangelicalism over the nature of what the lordship of Jesus meant. And, and power plays such a big role in that, right? In that understanding of Lord, that it yeah, is yeah. about power. Yeah. And the power, I mean, there's a huge power, of course, you know, this in the idea of kinship right. and the kingdom yeah. and it, cause it's, it's relational power. It's shared power. It's, right. It's familial 
power right. in the best sense of what familial power means. Um, and so it's connective power. Right. But in this idea, it's Jesus power over right. others. And those who, you know, represent Jesus, who in this case, all happen to be, you know, these white male fundamentalist leaders, and how they want to control um, all the rest of us. So it's a different kind of power. It's a power over versus, versus a power that develops within the connective circle of, of friends and family. Right. One power empowers everyone. And the other reduces power to a few. And is a power, as you said, power over as opposed to power with. And it's a yeah. huge distinction. Again, two different universes. Yeah. And both of them are uh, part of my experience. And, um, you know, next week with chapter five, um, I share a little bit more about that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what happens to me? Um, in the midst of the argument. I saw someone put up a thing about Oscar Romero. Um, Oscar Romero is, was just made a saint uh, recently um, in the Catholic Church by St. Francis um, or Pope Francis. And um, he was the Archbishop of El Salvador in the 1970s and, and he died in 1980. I believe he was actually killed in 1980 or early 1981. Um, but uh, he was an amazing person who had a conversion experience really from one idea of lordship exactly towards a different idea of lordship exactly. where Jesus was, he, Jesus was the Lord of the rich. Um, right. And then Jesus became the, the God among the poor mm -hmm. and that got him killed. Right. And so while well, he was celebrating mass, while he was celebrating mass and he was just a huge hero of my friends and I, I'm not entirely sure, but, um, in terms of evangelical colleges, uh, Westmont may have had one of the very first ever classes in liberation theology. We had this one really radical young professor who just wanted us to know the latest in theology. And so the same guy who uh, had that American evangelicalism class and told us to be on the lookout for Jerry Falwell, because most southern evangelicals were more like that than like the ones we knew in california yeah. um he was the same professor he taught both he taught early church history he taught liberation theology and contemporary theology and then he taught this american evangelicalism class and he was amazing i i owe a lot to him and i just want to underscore that the former understanding of lord i.e the empowering and power with is so liberating. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't get a, a lot of good um, consideration because it's quite patriarchal in language and all of that kind of stuff. Nevertheless, it was in the counter distinction to Caesar being Lord. Right, no, right. it's Caesar's not Lord, Jesus is Lord. And that means that when you have that power inside you, your slave owner is not your Lord. And, 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 and I've got cast in the, in the heart and the mind these days, but that kind of understanding of God being a radically egalitarian empowerer right, right. is the way you can overcome the higher, the lie that, mm -hmm. that we are all in a hierarchy of value. And that was, I, I talk about some of this in the chapter about uh, Jesus as Lord and Caesar you know, as Lord. And the mistake of the early church was not that Jesus was Lord. That testimony is powerful. Right. Um, but the mistake was when it identified Jesus as Lord, just like Caesar is Lord. Yeah. And so in the same way, Caesar sat atop this hierarchy in the Roman empire, all the, in the early church, there were historical realities where people said oh well okay let's just take caesar off we'll put caesar over here and um instead of caesar being lord jesus is lord and so they they kept the hierarchy but put a different lord at the top of it and that became deeply problematic yeah. and so 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 i do i do discuss that in the chapter so we need to close but i just wanted to you to see the uh affirmation from carrie um about needing both the love of Jesus and Yale locks to protect us. Yeah. Like you, God works in very practical ways. <laughs> <laughs> very
that's good. <laughs> so I am all about Yale locks. Well, so, it, it was really good to be with you all tonight and talk about this stuff. And I, I hope that you feel when you read these chapters, um, my own sort of journey as we finish up tonight was that when I wrote them, I actually was able to forgive myself for the years that I spent within evangelicalism. I think I had been holding that back and feeling some level of shame and sadness about having participated in those communities and certainly embarrassment if, if at, at the very minimum. And now after I worked on this book, I just kind of was able to let that all go and return to what was joyful and what was wise and what I really learned and embrace that as fully as I could. And um, to see the, the sad, uh, the sad part of evangelicalism with its tendency to keep turning its back on its best stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that just makes me sad now. And so I'm less mad yeah. and much more remorseful. Yeah. And I think a bit more compassionate yeah. um, in a time when it's popular to keep on white evangelicals. I think it's a very compassionate book and uh, against tribalism. And uh, it's at least two books. It's a great memoir. And it's also, no, it's at least three books. It's a great memoir. It's a great Bible study book. And it's also a great book of theology. And for you to weave it all together, I'm really grateful. And I have this collegial relationship with my director of music. I must keep up so I can yes. let this choir member go. So thank <laughs> you, Diana. We'll see you next week.